name's Ben. This is Megan. This is our bus, Kevin. It's named after the person that we bought the bus from. We were about a month away from becoming debt free and we were starting to kind of browse around online of different options, vintage trailers, tiny homes, a yurt. And then we stumbled upon this really cool Craigslist ad, very descriptive about this old prison bus mobile command center that had a generator and shore power and all of these different things already set up. The body was in really good condition. It was down in Massachusetts and we, within a week, went down and saw it, toured it, met the really interesting gentleman who was selling it, and um, we were sold, so. Entryway area is not done yet. It's on the to-do list. Yep, we want to summer. escape the cold of Maine, so that is still something we gotta do. All right, so this is a retired prison bus. So as you can see, we do have cages left over in here. We decided to keep two of them in the front and the back. Um, for security reasons and it kind of looks cool. So when we're out hiking, we can lock the bus up tight. This is everything we own. This is where we live. So we want to keep it secured and, and uh, it works great for that. And we can lock that front door as well. We just have to enter in through the back cage, hop up on the bed, yep. unlock this cage and then open it. So it's a little bit of a to-do, but if we have the option either mm -hmm. way of, of yep. keeping everything secure. So. so when we're driving, I'm up front here with Ben. We found this really cool low profile um, jump seat that's mounted to our prison cage up front here. And um, it's wonderful. I get to see everything as we're driving. And uh, our dog, Moose, actually, we put his dog bed right up front here with us as well. So all three of us get to be up front watching and um, hanging out up yep. there when we're driving. Suburbanseats.com. Their customer service is amazing. They're actually like a, a female-owned company, too. Small business, but we had it shipped within a day or two. Yeah. And I believe it was about $300. Well worth it. I would do it all over again. Very safe huh. seat belt and everything. Yeah, well. all quality. I'm actually going to upgrade my seatbelt because I just have the legal lap belt, which does nothing for you to protect your life. But <laughs> right now, that's what we're doing. Um, but you can get seatbelts from them. You can get all kinds of stuff, and they're fantastic. Yeah, and so as you come on in, we got our kitchen set up right here. And it's all open concept to keep it feeling nice and big. The countertop was something I picked up at a yard sale at a farmhouse in Maine. It's not actually this thick. It's only three-quarter. It's just some white pine barn board uh, that I got out of a guy's attic, uh, which is definitely something that you get really creative in where you're going to find all of your stuff. Go to yard sales, you know, go to old estate sales, Craigslist, you can find some really cool stuff to make your bus look fantastic. Uh, um, Habitat for Humanity Restore was also a really good resource for us. Yep. Like, um, with the cabinets, we built them all our, ourselves, and I put, like, different, you know, cabinet, um handles on on all of them and they were you know pennies on the dollar because we got everything second hand so yep and it makes it a little easier you don't have to buy sets of things which are they get pretty pricey especially right. if you're going with the, and they kind of look know, like everyone store. else so we wanted to you know do some little elements that were very unique and ben used to manage a reclaimed lumber company so we have many elements in here that are decades old like the countertop as ben said and also the floor which is gorgeous and has its own character. That's a, a reclaimed factory maple floor from Longleaf Lumber. And uh, basically it's just, it was an old maple floor in a factory, it got oil on it, it got destroyed. Uh, Longleaf Lumber took it, re-milled it, repurposed it, and made it into this awesome thing that you see here. And it works great, it's nice and rustic, so if you do scuff it up or if you have a dog with you know, toenails, scratching it, it looks fine, looks natural. So that really worked out for us. And it's really hard, which we kind of like. You do have to consider moisture in the bus and how you lay things down. This, we do have the floor insulated, so it's a floating floor. And then we have plywood down as a subfloor, which is tied into the walls with L brackets to keep things from, from moving too much. And it's all glued. And then we just laid the factory maple on top and nailed it down. We didn't glue it because they didn't want any cracking issues. Going forward, we probably could have, and it would have been fine because it's a narrow board, but if you go with any any wide boards, gluing things down, you sometimes can, can get some checking that goes along the center of it. So I use Waterlux, which is an oil base. It's similar to tongue oil. It's 
some people have used tongue oil on flooring, but it's not very durable and, and uh, you have to put a lot of coats to get any gloss and you're always trying to maintain it. Waterlux is a great tongue oil product that is hard enough and durable enough for floors. You do have to recoat it, but it's also really easy to maintain. So after a while, things start to fade. You don't have to resand everything. You can just lay another coat right on top of it. And it's, it's been around for, you know, I, I think the 1800, late 1800s, something like that. So it's, it's got a nice historical feel to it. So uh, the dining area here is pretty simple. This is uh, also reclaimed. It's, a, it's an old butcher block that we cut down and I believe Ben backplaned it as well. So the table, I don't know if you can see it underneath, but it has little stops underneath it that hold it up and we can yep. flip it down when we're traveling. Folds up and down. Which is really nice. Or if you want to do a little workout, P90X insanity in the bus and you're not going to jump too high, then fold that down. There's plenty of space right here. Yep. And that was really like important to us to maintain the space. It's not a big bus. It's a 31 footer. So you've got to, you know, design it to the lifestyle that you want. We're not very private with each other. So we're able to keep things simple and, and wide open all the way to the bed. And we'll go to the bathroom later. I'll show you guys that after, but things that fold down, things that can be tucked away. That's, that was really important to us so that we can maintain the larger feel in a really small space. Back to the cabinets for a second. We have like a small lip here, which I was a little bit concerned about because we obviously left Maine with some projects still to be done. We wanted to put a little, you know, stopper here, a little guard to keep the, the stuff in there, but we haven't had anything fall out of the cabinets yet. And I store all of my dry goods in like ball jars and things like that. And uh, nothing's fallen out or broken yet, yeah. knock on wood. So that's really worked out and everything fits too. As you can see, we don't have too, too much cabinet space, but we've traveled 3,400 miles and we've been in the bus for a couple of weeks now and things are working out. We're actually finding that we brought a little bit too much stuff, you know, um, so you find that out once you actually get out there and start living uh, full time in the bus. So. Yeah. I love cooking, I love baking, so I was a little bit concerned at first going very simple with our kitchen setup. Maine, the state of Maine is very strict about ensuring a bus conversion like this, so we ran into a bit of trouble with that. Thankfully we were on the beginning end of our conversion, so we were able to set it up accordingly. And so the one thing that they get really hung up on is um, having a full stove and propane and all of that stuff in your cooking area. So we decided to go for a very small butane, you know, cooktop like this, just one, even though we love cooking, because it's a way around it and they're fine with that. It's totally okay. So I cook all of our own meals. We, we don't really go out to eat much and I've been able to maintain the same diet that we would at home. Yeah. Pretty much. Probably even healthier. Minus the cookies and great. the pizza because we don't have an oven. Yeah, I do miss cookies and pizza. <laughs> I rocked both of those before at home. But yeah, so that's been fine. And this sink, actually I want to mention a little bit about that. So we, while we were building the bus this summer, we tried out a very small sink. It was, I don't know, 10 by 10 or something. It was square, like a hand wash sink. Yeah. We were like, that's going to be plenty. We're living in a bus this will be fine. It was the worst. Like within a couple of weeks of, of attempting to wash dishes in something that small, we wanted to go for a bigger sink. So we found this second hand. I think it cost us five or eight dollars. Restore. Um, it was the restore. Yeah. Have have you so, you. and this double bay is great. We can use the right side as kind of drying and everything. So one of the systems that we weren't able to get set up is our hot water before we left. So we just have like two tanks underneath the sink. We have two tanks underneath the sink, one five gallon fresh water and then one gray tank underneath. So those are all, you know, piped into the sink. And then we just have a very simple marine hand pump for right now. And it's been great. It's been fine it for works. now. It works for now. You would gotta I... heat up water for right now, but uh, you know. That's... To wash dishes, yes. Yeah. That's fine. Would it be better if we had a nice large, you know, faucet that had hot running water at a moment's notice? Yes, but yep. we'll get there. That's but fine. I will say that having something like this has trained us to conserve our water. And when you're out here in Arizona, it's mm -hmm. really important. Uh, you don't have streams or anything like that where you can fill up. So Especially if you're boondocking. If you're boondocking, your water 
is very important. And we've found that we can make five gallons work for a couple of days at least. Sometimes, sometimes two days, um, a little less if we decide to do a solar shower. But you know, doing dishes with just a little bit. It's totally doable. When we actually get the faucet, I'm a little worried that we'll get so spoiled with it, we'll start using up all of our water. But I think with the training, we'll be all right. Absolutely, it, it makes you think about all of your water usage when you're in a home or apartment mm -hmm. and how much we're spoiled with that and can not even think about it. And I mean, even when you, when you flush a toilet and you have a, a gallon gallons, or whatever or, yeah. that, that goes down, you know, we have a composting toilet, which you'll see, um, so we can avoid that. But dishwashers and sinks and stuff like that. It's a lot of water. It's a lot. So The other thing that it's taught me so far, living in the bus full time, what it's taught me is about trash, you know, like, right? So living in a regular apartment, you don't really think about it. You put your trash on the side of the, the road or in a dumpster and it's not a big deal, but you have to think about where you're going to put it, you know? And, and so we've cut the amount of trash. Like we're conscious about the food that we buy and the packaging that it comes in a little bit more than we used to because, you know, that'll equal trash on the, the back end. So and mm -hmm. zero food waste too, if at all possible. Yeah, we'll uh, pair pretty much every meal with a little bit of bread to clean our plate. So it makes doing yes. dishes a lot easier and, you know, it's tasty. So. so originally when we bought the bus, we had two very large AC units on top of the bus. Great. No safety hatch because... Yes, we did not have any emergency uh, hatch because it was a prison bus. So, last thing you want is prisoners crawling out of a bus. <laughs> so, uh, we ended up getting rid of our AC units thinking that we would rather be off-grid. We'd rather not have to worry too much about powering something like that and bulk up the insulation. We can't be in 100 plus degrees, but we're in probably close to 80 right now, and it's very, very comfortable. comfortable. We replaced them with just very simple RV roof fence. There's no fan in there, but they do work fantastic. I think I got them for like, you know, 20, 20 bucks on dollars. Amazon, something simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the holes were standard, so they fit right in there, just like the AC unit fits right in there. Yep, yeah. didn't have to modify it. The person who installed them did them a little crooked, which drove me crazy, but we're going to live with it. Yeah. And the insulation is probably one of the most important things that you're going to do in a bus. So I think I spent a month's worth of At work least. doing that. A lot of people go with the spray foam insulation, which is absolutely fantastic. I tried to go a little bit cheaper. So what I ended up doing was doing the hard foam insulation. For insulation, I did two inch hard foam insulation. Uh, glued up on a curve. Any gaps in there, I just filled with uh, gaps and cracks. Great spray stuff. foam, great stuff, which is great and also very messy. Make sure that it is the first thing that you do in your bus and not after you've laid down your floor. Because once you're done, it looks like an alien cocoon in here. <laughs> and you gotta cut off all the little pieces. So I had that laid down at first. It, there's like over 200 cut individual pieces that I had to lay on the curve. If I had to do it all over again, I don't think I would do it that way. I would do the spray foam insulation. That took you the entire the extra... month of July. Yeah. Pretty much a nightmare. But, you know, living you learn. On top of that, I did bubble wrap reflectix and then a one inch air gap. With spacers. With spacers in there. And then putting the original panels back up, I glued another lay layer of bubble wrap reflectix on top of that. So the only thing that's touching the ribs of the bus are the tech screws that are holding up these interior panels. So if you touch the roof panels on a hot day, it's nice and cool and comfortable. Yeah. It's like a thermos. There's a there's an airspace, you have very little conduction. So you're thinking about insulation and you're thinking about conduction in a space like this and you're so in a metal in enclosure, so it's important. Heat and the cold it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As far as insulation goes, same thing with the walls. I didn't end up doing this. I just have regular pink foam insulation in the walls. I think I used a three inch pink foam insulation. Don't lose a lot of heat in the walls or gain a lot of heat in the walls. But I think still, if I had to do it all over again, I would do spray foam mm -hmm. and possibly bubble wrap insulation with an air gap to keep that conduction down. Really don't want to skimp on any type of insulation. The floor is insulated with inch and a half hard foam, which I think I already mentioned. So I'll pick up from there. We lose a lot of heat and gain a lot of heat from the windows. So we decided to, I see a lot of bus conversions that remove certain windows or all of them. We decided to keep all of them. Nice and bright in here. It's just something that we wanted. So 
But we made these curtains, which help a lot, but you still gain and lose a lot of heat in um, through, through the windows. So a work in progress, you know, we might upgrade that in the future to do some uh, bubble wrap reflectix to, you know, hold in our, our I, heat or keep it out. I originally built this small space in here to have bubble wrap reflectix roll down on either really hot days or really cold days on just one side of the bus. So if you're parked, you park towards the sun on that side of the bus to keep the heat out. It's really um, been fine so far. Like we've been... Finding out it's fine. We've slept in the bus on cold Maine nights and warmer Arizona, you know, days. And I think it's been very cool and comfortable 99% of the time yeah. so far. So Just conscious of how you park and where you're parking in the sun. It's wintertime right now, so the sun is not... As, as, uh, strong. as strong and it's not as high in the sky mm -hmm. and the curtains really do help they do also sell blackout curtains which we have yet to install which do a really great job it's really it's just a very thin like um yeah plastic so material blackout yeah. is and yeah they sell it you know by the yard as you would fabric so on our curtain that we have which i highly suggest a curtain across the front to kind of block the front cab from the body of your bus with that curtain, I sewed in a layer of blackout, so it's nice and thick, and um, it, that you know, as soon as you cover it, you can feel the the heat or you know the cool in here so much more. So it really helps it significantly, um, and it also looks really nice. So. Yep, you can sew it right to the back of your curtains or yep. have it as a separate curtain. So, It'll always be a work in progress, just like owning a home. You're going to be thinking about things you can add, thinking about what you can upgrade. We're going to continue our cabinets over here to have more storage more space. Storage. So that's the one thing that we've um, realized so far. We don't have a lot of stuff. We got rid of like 90% of our belongings before we left uh, Maine, but still we need a little bit more storage space because it, a small space like this, 165 square feet, and it gets messy really fast. So think about that, how you live your life, how much stuff you have, and, you know, having it kind of tucked away in a cabinet or something neater really makes a big difference. Oh, one thing I want to touch on, too. So I did all the woodworking myself, not because I'm a fancy woodworker, just because YouTube is available and you can learn all these things. I have power tool experience and stuff like that, but that's very simple. Anyone can learn it. One tool that I recommend if you're doing your own cabinetry, uh, and I used it for so many so things many in the bus, things. is a, a pocket screw jig. It's fantastic. It's a method of joinery that you just drill an angular uh, hole and then you're able to make cabinet carcasses, any type of box. Uh, it's just, it takes all the time out of it. Everything, I mean, anything that, any built-ins, yep. uh, the cabinets, the couch, over, uh, everything. Everything is screwed Pocket together. Pocket screw jig, yeah. If you add glue to that too, like that's another thing, your bus is gonna shake and rattle uh, and hopefully never roll. <laughs> So glue, screw, everything you can. There's a lot of weight inside your cabinets if you're hanging them. So you have to make sure that you bolt them, not just to panels, but you gotta go right through Into to the actual studs. ribs of your bus. Mm -hmm. So that everywhere you can. Positioning really yeah. Yeah. Dictates. Tech screws are your best friend. Use them and, and overkill is definitely important. I didn't do any runners going in this direction at all. This is all just the panels are just screwed into the original ribs of the bus. And so like these are secured at these points and then also along here. These are put in with just re your regular self-tapping screws as well. So I see um, some buses that leave the metal like frames around the windows exposed. So we had extra flooring so we used every bit of this reclaimed floor. So we used it on the window frames here, also with the, the face of the cabinets, and then also with the couch. So we'll move on to the couch. So I was mentioning that we used every foot of this reclaimed wood floor in other places too. So we used it on the faces of the cabinets and all of the window frames here. Uh, up and down and then also on the couch here Ben I'll let Ben talk about how awesome this couch design that he found on I don't know where you found it but it's awesome as with pretty much every tiny home idea Pinterest and YouTube and all those fun sites <laughs> this is where I got the inspiration for that but I use this here here let's get this out of the way so this is the couch <laughs> um, we're using it 
for storage mostly now, but it does pull out to a guest bed if anyone is brave enough to come stay in our bus with us. Uh, we had leftover flooring. Pulls out like that. Interlock the tongue and groove. Uh, and it also lifts up like a chest. So when your bus, you're always thinking about oh, no. extra space. <laughs> uh, anywhere you can store things. We have some books in there right now. But uh, it's a really simple design. If you do want to have a guest bed, uh, it's just you're screwing every other slat to a piece of wood so that you have a stopper. And then you just uh, screw it in. Here's a good example of that pocket screw jig in action. I used it for this as well. Everything looks more complicated until you start doing it. That's absolutely true. So for something like this, which looks intricate, it's it has moving pieces to it. Honestly, I, I had a hard time finding a how-to for this, but I did see a lot of pictures, and sometimes it boils down to just sort of inspecting the different pictures that you can find online of, you know, the, the little pieces, and making up as you go. Oftentimes, once you start, most of the, the pieces inside this bus and most of the, the woodworking that's done starts with a box. Everything's a box, and you go from there. So this is a box with some tongue and groove flooring screwed to the top of it and simply interlinked. It's also over the wheel well, right? Yeah, you know, so... we so made use of that. You, you know, gotta cover kind of stuff up. Space. The generator pops up a little bit underneath here, and the wheel well is over there, so you think about ways you can cover up the unsightly parts of your bus, but still make them functional. And create storage um, space at the same time. Exactly. Create storage space. So, like, you know, you see things online where, ooh, that's a curve. Like, ooh, oh no. Jigsaw. Simple. <laughs> it's not hard. Once you get going, it's easy. You know? This... Oh no, moving parts, not a big deal. You just put a piece of wood to keep the, everything from falling down here, and you screw it in this way. So this space is kind of, we left it open. We have a 75 pound dog, <clears throat> so that's kind of his bed area here. Ben and I made these, these little chairs too. This is a good example too of like something we found a tutorial online. We love these chairs. You can buy them, I don't know, 50 to 100 dollars, who knows how much they are different places. I know LL being curious of that. Anyway, you can buy these chairs, top dollar, fifty dollars, or look up a tutorial online and build it yourselves. I think this is just a fun yep. afternoon project that we did Took together. Took a day to make. I uh, sewed the top and Ben made the wood bottom, well, so. Just stapled it, stapled the, uh, the fabric right to the wood and stuff. Pretty simple. And these are definitely online. You can probably find in a simple search, a hundred different ways to make folding wooden chairs. Yeah, way cheaper to make them yourself, so. Our table is lower than your standard table, so buying a chair wasn't, you know, a great option for us. We didn't have chairs for a long time because we couldn't find ones that we liked. We were like, do we do a stool? Do we do this? Everything was either too high or too short, so we made our own. Moose's dog bed area here, we left that area pretty open for him since he's so huge. And then we're moving over here to the wood stove, which is Ben's favorite part of the bus. He jokes around that he built the entire bus around the wood stove. So I was talking about how, you know, a large regular size wood stove obviously won't work for a tiny home, but we found tinywoodstove.com, tinywoodstoves.com. Yeah. And uh, this little dwarf stove is awesome. We love it. So I'll let Ben kind of talk about the setup and he built this really awesome hearth around it as well and reinforced it. So I'll let him talk about that. Yeah, so this definitely was a project. It has so much ambiance and homey feel, which was very, very important to us. Again, it's a tiny space. It's all we have. And the last thing we wanted to, to, to feel is like we're living out of a vehicle. We want to feel like this is home. Mm -hmm. So this little guy is a four kilowatt dwarf stove from tinywoodstoves.com. They make their own, which is the dwarf line. And they also, I believe, sell a bunch of other lines like the Hobbit and stuff like that. So they are a really great resource. It came with... Pretty much everything. I think you just had to buy one additional length of stovepipe. Yep, which was pretty simple. So, like, you, you don't have uh, a standard pipe with a small wood stove like this. But you got to be careful not to mix up the, the uh, I think this is a 3-inch or 4-inch diameter. You can find that diameter in a lot of hardware stores, but it's made for pellet stoves. And they can't handle the temperature of a wood stove. So, we had this little bend custom-made at just your regular uh, wood stove shop, very Metal simple. Fabrication. Yep, they, yep. They, it was just, 
I don't know, maybe forty dollars or something like that. Not hard, not hard to find, and they can give you the right gauge of steel for that. And then going through your wall, especially with your insulation, you don't want to go through your wall and worry about lighting your insulation on fire. So you have to have a double lined stove pipe. And this thing can be, you know, up to up to 300, 400 degrees and you can still put your hand on this and you don't have to worry at all. They provided the double line as well as the, the top, which we can look at when we go outside. It was a, a whole tiny home kit, which worked out very well for the bus. It's made to secure, it's made to be mobile. Uh -huh. So I would definitely, check them out and the stove bolts right in too so that's another thing they're made to just not go anywhere when you're driving so another example of us kind of using what we had and as much secondhand as possible the granite slab that you see it sitting on we picked that up at a yard sale it used to be attached to like this wooden uh, kitchen cart i think it cost us twenty dollars um, so we pulled that off of it i sold the wooden cart part of it and we used the granite in here so um really worked out but we're driving 55 60 miles an hour and this is a 100 pound wood stove so you got to make sure you secure everything down everywhere so the granite but you can just use a carbide bit drill bit for that, drilled holes into that, and then lag bolted everything through all the way through to the wheel well. It, there is plywood underneath here as well. And then the hearth, this was a tricky, tricky thing because this is actually hollow. This is fake brick tile. Mm -hmm. So a lot, again, a lot of vibration, um, or if somebody comes over and they want to lean on this thing, you got to overbuild stuff. So it's very simple though. I just made a plywood form and then I put some cement board down on it. I asked the guys at Home Depot, what is the best mortar you can use, stickiest for a mobile situation? So I don't know the name of it, but um, you know they pointed me in the right it's direction. It's more flexible than your standard yep. mortar. Yeah, haven't had any problems with it. But with a thin wall like this, I had to make sure that it couldn't flex at all. So you pop your tiles off. So I just took some steel, flat steel here, and then square tubing steel all along here and I just screwed all that into the wheel well into the wall to keep stuff from moving and super solid and simple as that I used an angle you know I didn't uh, need a wet saw from that you know a lot of times you'll see tile cutters they can be very expensive I just got a diamond bit for my angle grinder which if you're doing a bus conversion you don't have an angle grinder you're not going to do a bus conver conversion <laughs> uh, so that was, I don't know, 10 bucks. Very simple. You can cut all the tile with that. I had no cracking. It was fantastic. And this thing heats up the bus, no problem. Really, you know, you could go a little bit larger if you're in really cold climates. I would go with the five kilowatt, but uh, you know, and you'll get a longer burn time because you have a bigger box. But we don't plan to be in cold climates for very long, so. And then he has this really nice wooden, uh, or wood storage, really nice wood storage area to the right of the, the stove. So yep. kindling in the box behind. Iron pipe. So yeah, those elements like the wood stove, like the couch, the chairs, the, you know, these little things that we've done ourselves really make it feel like home, and I think that's so important. I actually kind of had a bit of a breakdown right before we left on this trip, because we had just moved out of our apartment, you know, it, this was it. Like, it wasn't just this thing we were looking forward to in, anymore. We were actually going to live in the bus, and, um... It was scary. It's a little bit scary, you know, but within a day or two of you know, actually reaping the benefits of all this hard work in this homey space we've created. It was awesome. It really was. Yep. Yeah. So now I'm sold. I'm totally into it. It's wonderful. Move on to the bathroom situation. It's one of the like most frequently asked questions mm, I get. Is, where's your toilet? And where's your shower? What do you guys do for that? Because we don't have any walls put up, so it's kind of a different... We went our own way with the bathroom situation. So I'll let Ben explain. So... About so that. we have a composting toilet. It is an air head. There is much debate about the air head and the nature's head. I think both are fantastic products. They're I, expensive, but I would, I mean. Totally worth it. Totally worth it. And you know, all in all, you're, you don't need a, a black tank when you have a composting toilet. It takes care of all of that. Separates the pee from the poo. So you're not creating sewage. And it's as simple as when you stop at a truck stop, you can dump your pee down the toilet. And once the compost is done doing its thing, you can get about, we haven't gone through a full cycle of this yet, but like I hear month? about a month's worth of, of full-time use with two people. 
you do, yeah, you're going to spend, you know, 900 to $1,100 for a really nice composting toilet, but you get all the components with it and you don't have to spend that money on a black tank. So it's really, it's not that expensive. Uh, it's totally worth getting and it doesn't smell at all. Because ever. An awesome There's fan. a vent that goes through, uh, vents out the bottom of the bus. Would definitely be careful about where you put that vent, if you have any intakes or anything like that, any fans. Just be aware of where that's venting out. And you also want to be aware uh, that you're not creating any like any weird backdrafts when you're driving. So you want to have that, that, that negative suction mm -hmm. continuing to make sure that you're not getting any weird wafty smells through it. But I mean, you can literally open it up and there is no smell at all because that fan just keeps things going in it. That so, fan runs off our solar too. Yeah. Mentioned. Fan runs off our solar. Uh, it's just a small DC computer fan and that has to run 100% of the time. So make sure if you are hooking that up to your battery bank that you have enough battery power to make sure that that never stops running because then this smell will happen. So it's really simple. We This is our nightstand and our toilet. So I hear a lot of schoolies and conversion uh, vehicles kind of joking about like where their toilets are in their bus and some people can make breakfast and sit on the toilet at the same time. Ours is our nightstand and it's our toilet. Doors open up, that swings up. If you wanted to keep an open concept and still have privacy, we have considered the idea of just having some fold-up curtains that come up after you open and you can have this a complete enclosure. What's great about keeping the original panels instead of doing wood paneling is that everything's magnetic, which it was the reason that we wanted to keep it. Aside from it, it kind of keeps the original look of the bus, which mm -hmm. we like. And again, you can put magnetic curtains in your shower, you can do it in your toilet, and you don't have to sacrifice all of your space. It uses zero water aside from us doing a little spritz every now and then to clean it. So like we have just a 40 gallon tank in the back for our fresh water, our drinking water and our dish water and everything like that and it can last us uh, two weeks like no problem. Yeah. So without toilet water you can go a lot longer. This here is a work in progress at the moment but again it was the wheel well came out to here and we had to cover it up with something and hey we need a shower right now we have solar shower outside which works fantastic and even if you have an interior shower gotta go with an outdoor solar shower as well and makes life a lot easier when you're just doing a quick rinse but this opens up to a japanese soaking tub which we'll show you later when we're done it <laughs> um so basically it's just a box and has a, a liner inside with a little seat um, and a drain at the bottom. If you open this up, there will be your faucets here. And if you want to take a shower, you can just sit in there and use the wand or hang it up and have magnetic curtains that will come up as well. If you're feeling luxurious and you miss home and the warmth of taking a bath, look into Japanese soaking tubs. They're a great option to have a tub in a very small space. Almost a little bit better because you can sit down and the water goes right up to your neck rather than having to lay in a long tub. So there's a little luxury that we weren't willing to sacrifice. So another luxury that we weren't willing to sacrifice on is the bed. So we had this awesome memory foam bed at our apartment before we moved into the bus. So we wanted the same situation. Queen size bed all the way and lots of storage underneath. So that's what we created here. The bus had these like metal pole stand things, about nine of them, with a top and a bottom screw holes around each. I, you know, I'm just like drawing it in my brain right now. But anyhow, we used that as, you know, the frame underneath the bed and then built a wooden frame on top of it. And then the mattress just sits nice and tight right on top of there. So again, this was a YouTube video of somebody making a bed frame. There's probably a hundred of them out there, but you just look up queen size, king size, whatever you're going to have. And super simple. It's yeah, it two by sixes. And it's a lot. It's very, very simple build mm -hmm. video to do that. And then if you, you know, like Megan was saying, we, we did have some like neat metal stands that we used to hold the bed up. But it's as simple as using something like iron pipe yeah. with the little tops and bottoms screwing that in. Yep. That can hold your bed in place. And then you just want to make sure you also screw it to the walls to keep it from shaking when you're driving. 
So the bed, you know, is kind of a, our dog goes up on there sometimes. It's a very comfortable place for us to feel like we're at home. So we love it, you know, and eventually we'd like to build some, I see some buses that have like, you know, bookshelves and some storage space at the foot of the bed. I love that. Um, so this summer we're thinking of adding that space over here because we do have some kind of dead space at the foot of the bed so storage opportunities yep. there so underneath i love this part so we downsized our clothing so much i probably only kept about 10 percent of what we owned um so we each have ben made these really nice flush uh drawers which again one of those projects that seemed a lot you know more complicated but once he did it i was like wow that's you know just it, a box. It came out really well, and it's just a box. So anyway, we have a his and hers, you know, that holds all of our clothes right there. Yeah, slides um, out to about there. Slides right out. And then we have these nice little locks, which if you forget to lock it, it's the worst when you're driving. So, but very simple. And then underneath, that kind of holds our electronics and stuff like that. And also doubles as a little step up onto the bed, um, because our bed's a bit high. So, yep, you can step up on as that. Ben is demonstrating. Just like so. that. Um, yeah, so that's been kind of enough storage and then one other little storage area Which I'll let Ben explain because it's one of his favorite things again. The, yeah, aside from the wood stove This is my favorite part of the bus. It's my secret storage compartment it's just a big door. Very pumped about that. Yeah <laughs> There's some very secret toilet paper stashed away in there super fancy so the rest of the storage that we have underneath the bed is accessed from the back door and we call it the garage. Our solar, you know, components, our batteries are underneath there. What else? Our fresh water tank, our backpacks, those are big and bulky uh, for hiking and other fun things. So that's something down there. Tools. that was important too. When you're RVing full time and you're going to be in cold climates, you got to think about your fresh water and freezing. So we chose to keep the fresh water tank instead of being mounted underneath inside. the bus, we keep it inside. I have heard people also mounting it underneath the bus and just insulating it in a box itself. You can be as simple as putting a light that shines at it, which will keep it from freezing. But if you're going to be in really cold climates for any lengthy period of time, you're going to get freezing problems. So we keep that underneath the bus there. Uh, it is not all plumbed into the sink yet, but when it is, another another aspect of keeping things from not freezing is that we're just going to have some exposed pipes that like go across, across the top, here. sort of just yeah. play off that industrial look that's very popular the and copper looks good. And you can always hang stuff okay, on. Okay, so at first we thought that we would be able to survive off of a Yeti cooler. Definitely can't. Uh, that only <laughs> takes you so far. So we actually got a smallish fridge which holds everything that, I mean, and we're big on healthy, you know, I cook all of our own food and everything, we cook all of our own food, so it's been completely sufficient. It has a tiny freezer, which doesn't work that well, but that's okay, um, and it runs off of our solar, so that's really wonderful. I think we got it at Home Depot, again, like a sale thing, I, don't, I believe it was about $100. 100 bucks for a small fridge like that, and honestly, some people ask about the propane electric hybrids which are really great but propane makes me uncomfortable especially because i have a wood stove in here so simple as running a tiny dorm fridge off from solar works great works great so for our drinking water we keep this berkey water filter filled all the time this is wonderful i believe it was about 300 dollars a little bit pricey but wow it can filter out just about anything we put all kinds of different you know sort water sources into it and it generates the most delicious water ever. So we always keep this full for our drinking water and then the fresh water that we get from, you know, wherever we are, we use for dishes and things like that. So the Berkey is wonderful for drinking water. That thing will, they use that in third world countries and it honestly can filter out the nastiest looking water. The way we test it to make sure that the filters don't need to be changed is you put food coloring in your water and it'll filter out the food color and come out clear. So that's the kind of power that this thing has. The filters um, last about six months to a year, depending on your usage of it. And we've never had to change them yet because we're not going like wild with it until right now, but it's definitely worth the price that it is. Mm -hmm. So when we bought our bus, it was this kind of scary shade of black slash red slash dusty 
rust. The condition of the paint was pretty good. There was just surface rust, nothing, no pitting, no holes or anything like that. So that was one of the major reasons why we purchased this bus was because the body was in such good condition, but we knew that we had to paint it. Like from day one, we were not going to accept the way that it looked before. So we at first thought, okay, we'll do the interior conversion and sub out the painting part. So we got three quotes. All were within the range of nine to $12,000 minimum to get the bus painted. And that was even with us doing some of the prep work ourselves. Yeah, that did not include any body work at right. all. So and you're talking $15,000 for a professional job. All in, exactly. So that wasn't something that we were willing to put in. So we started to think of ways that we could paint the bus ourselves. And what we realized is that it would just require a significant amount of elbow grease not as much as we um, ended up putting it, or we didn't anticipate how much work it would actually be. It probably took us, we just worked on weekends because we both had full-time jobs during the conversion. So we just worked on weekends and it was in pretty favorable temperatures and it required both of us, you know, 10 hours a day of meticulous sanding, bended a lot of bondo i did some bondo too um, uh, yeah so that's something that i think was a little unique to our bus it had been, been converted into a mobile command center and the people who did that conversion just put a bunch of bolts through the walls so when we bought the bus and finally removed all of the old stuff it looked like swiss cheese so when dealing with holes you can bondo it you can weld in new panels we didn't um, have anything big enough to require welding at all. So we used like metal and for metal and forest. Bondo, yeah. Was so it? there is the uh, basic like bodywork pink Bondo stuff, um, which is a great product, but I wouldn't recommend it for an application like this as it will crack over time and you'll have uh, a ruined paint job. So I ended up putting, you can put sheet metal behind the hole on the interior side. And then there's this metal reinforced Bondo. Uh, you can get it at any Napa or whatever store like that. Is rated so that you can actually drill into it. It dries really, really hard and it'll flex with the uh, temperature change of the metal of your bus. That stuff is fantastic. I use it on all the holes. I would absolutely recommend it. And I haven't had any cracking issues on our paint job at all. So that was part of the prep month, I guess I'll call it. You know, it was a real test of our marriage slash the whole bus life thing in general that I reached a breaking point on one day, I remember where I was like, I don't think I can do this. I'm sick. I'm covered in sand and dust. And we've been doing this for so many hours. I don't think I can do this. But then we got to the weekend where we were actually going to paint. So we went to Napa Auto Parts and we went with a three part automotive paint to, uh, you know, the primer and then the, the color coat. This is my favorite color on the planet, by the way. I like to be surrounded by it. I went with automotive paint. We bought like kind of a cheapish sprayer, a spray gun. I see some people rolling, some people spraying. Harbor Freight has a great paint sprayer. It's a good quality. The guys from Napa actually recommended <clears throat> it to me. I think around 60 bucks or something like that. Totally worth it. And worked fantastic. Yep. Uh, we had no problems whatsoever. Biggest thing if you're gonna be using a paint sprayer is make sure you have a good compressor. You don't want a tiny pancake compressor. If you gotta borrow somebody's larger compressor, really important because you will start to lose your pressure fast, have to wait. Uneven. Uh, and it's all about timing when you're doing a job mm -hmm. this big. So there was two of us, like, you know, just Ben and I on the paint day. So I was kind of like the mixer and Ben was covered in a, like a Tyvek type suit uh, and doing all of the, the spraying and I was prepping the paint and you know feeding it in because the sprayer itself wasn't very big so we had to refill it several times and we were like running against the clock kind of thing if you are lucky enough to be able to paint your bus in a clean room wow hats off to you that's so <laughs> awesome we had to paint it in like a, a sand pit it was a sand pit mm. yeah it's kind of parking lot kind of like this but you know i know it sounds east. like every professional painter in the world would be like what in Whoa. a sandy place that's totally stupid we were gifted with fantastic weather and one little trick is to wet your area with a hose to keep yep. the dust down yep it's hard to find a place to park 
a giant rig like this to have it sprayed. So you gotta work with what you got. We did the best with what we had to work with and we think it came out awesome. So all in, um, doing the paint job ourselves cost us, I would say about $700. And if you compare that to nine to 12,000 minimum, we're pretty happy with it. Work-wise, at least, let's say 10, 20, 40, 60, probably 100 hours both of us at least and that's 90 Prep percent prepping the paint job itself took four one day hours yeah it took four hours the actual paint i remember we started that's it at priming like and painting 4 30 p.m and we ended around 8 30 and by the end of it we were lighting the bus with our headlights um because it was dark in maine at that point so you know it was it was crazy yeah. but yeah it was so weird how you spent an entire month basically prepping it to do four hours of work at the end to, to make it is yep. wild. And as much prep work as you're going to do, you'll always feel like you could have done more. Yeah. But at some point, you got to just call it. If we could go back in time, sure, I might have to ground a little bit more down and smooth some surfaces up a little bit more. Yeah. Um, if you're dealing with a bus that's got old paint and you have chipping paint then you have to feather it real smooth so that you don't see the old paint lines but what the great thing about a bus like this is it's got rub rails it's busy already no one's going to be looking at it with magnifying glass so don't stress about stuff like that right it's more about protecting it that's what we were really concerned about because we had the bus for over a year before we painted it and uh, going through a northeast winter you know I don't know we wanted to protect it so yep. now we feel like it is and we're really happy with it so you get the paint job done but there's still quite a bit of work after that because you have to take off all of your hardware before you actually paint it so we kept all of our original hardware and we used um rust reformer we love we probably used i don't know 10 cans of this it's a black rust-oleum product rust reformer so i just did that on all of our hardware and then a nice coat of black gloss because the actual hardware was in rough shape but it's better than buying brand new stuff and uh, we have plenty of mirrors so we we drove it all the way across country and Ben's super happy with the mirrors I would say yeah when you're driving something like this it's not like your new RVs with the awesome views and the and the curved glass you have a lot of blind spots so lots of mirrors if you don't have a lot of mirrors on your bus you can get some more I have three mirrors on the driver's side one flat and two that are convex that allow me to have zero blind spots when somebody's passing you because that's your biggest concern when you're lane changing you want to make sure you're not merging into another car that you can't see and these front guys are my like primaries i'm looking in these all the time they'll show you all the way from the nose of your bus to the tail the only blind spot i have in this thing is in the very back you can't see behind your bus obviously you just get a reverse camera and it's no problem whatsoever very easy to set up especially with the school buses with the the bottom window and the door really easy to mount a reverse camera totally yep. worth getting that's yeah. locked it's i think not, right oh, now it's locked. okay so we um but, and i've seen some buses that don't have any exterior storage we have a bit of it we have a full spare tire on the other side and then these two metal storage boxes which i think holds our tools like we have a couple toolboxes two, in there two regular size toolboxes in here for just like on roads type stuff wrenches yep. and stuff like that this is our starter battery this is not locked that pulls out on the slide as well I would like a little bit more storage. And we have a spot for it. And yeah, there's a couple extra spots. This generator down, here. Uh, so this generator came with the bus. It's We used it more before we got solar. We have two 300 watt panels on top that power pretty much everything we use inside the bus right now. So we haven't really used it since we've been on this particular trip, but prior to, it was essential. When we were painting the bus, we ran our compressor off of the generator which made for an interesting day because we had to kind of cover up the generator but <laughs> allow it to breathe. But it's been really great. In any case where we didn't have power when we were working on the bus, we were able to just start it up, start it up like a It's a, a 50 train. amp generator, mm -hmm. so we can power power tools. It's great, we really lucked out with that, with yeah. the bus. What's nice <laughs> too is out here in Arizona, we don't have to worry about cloudy days right now, so we haven't had to use it. But when your batteries start to die, make sure you tie in your generator to your battery bank mm -hmm. and you can flip that thing on and keep them topped off because you don't want those to get too low it will ruin your battery bank so originally we, we um 
went with Alt E, which is a great company out of Massachusetts. We went with a solar kit. They have a tiny house kit. So we have two 300 watt panels on the roof and 400 amp hours of AGM batteries. We went with the AGM batteries instead of your standard lead acid batteries because they don't require venting. Technically they require venting in a catastrophic uh, but they are closed. They don't leak hydrogen gas like lead acid batteries do. So they're a little less maintenance, a little more expensive, but not that bad. And the uh, reason we went with a kit was because the solar was the one area that we weren't super well versed on. And it's nice, you know, to have that face to face via the phone about what you need, what you don't need, that kind of thing. So the kit kind of came with everything, it actually came with some extra stuff um, yep. that we worked with this really knowledgeable friend of a friend who helped us install the solar. That was essential. And he was able to tell us exactly out of the kit what we needed and what we didn't. So that might be an area where assistance is very welcome. Yeah, I, I would definitely recommend you going forward, done, right? if we were to do it all over again, now that we know what we need, I don't think I will go with a kit. I would definitely pick our components out the way we want to customize it. Learn. You live and you learn. You will pay more with a kit and you will definitely get probably more than you need, which is not a bad thing. We have really great charge controller, midnight solar charge controller, so I never worry about our batteries, you know, getting overcharged or undercharged, anything like that. Our inverter is really high quality as well. So I'm thankful that we went with that. but talk to an expert, speak to a couple of people, speak to you, the guy who's gonna install it if it's not gonna be you. If you don't have any experience and you're not very comfortable with electricity, absolutely go with a professional and who has done a solar application. These panels will collect electricity regardless if they're plugged into anything. So when you're mounting them, that is something you have to consider. It's not like tying yourself into the grid. So what we run off of it, we didn't mention this inside actually, but we have a small refrigerator. It's like about this tall with a tiny freezer. It holds everything that we need. It's been great so far on this trip. So that's always plugged into solar, always running. And then we have our fan for our composting toilet. We have a couple of lights and uh, I run like coffee grinder, immersion blender, small appliances like that. It's totally fine. So it's, it's definitely sufficient yep. for what we need. And you just um, work on your timing of things. You're going to be yeah. charging your stuff during your during charging the day phone, yeah. and running your blenders and your vacuum cleaners. Mm -hmm. It can handle that. You just don't want to do it at night. There were a lot of old parts that came with the bus, like uh, different AC units and fans and other things. So there was something under here before that we, we ripped out. Yeah, as part of the back and cooling, cooling and system. heating. Yeah, so we um, took that out. We'd like to do like a- seats. Heat, keeping your feet warm kind of stuff. A storage box under here, like Ben said, we would love to have more exterior storage. So we have opportunities for that to expand on one of the projects on our to-do list for sure. So what else? Going on back to the garage. That is where all of our components for our solar is on one side and then boxed off. We have our fresh water tank on this side. We did end up going with a portable gray tank and I think we're just gonna sell it because- It didn't fit under the bus. Yeah, we're gonna go with a mount now that we know that we're not gonna be in freezing cold temperatures all the time and it's kind of cumbersome. So it, it's great, but it didn't work for our application. So. Trial and error. Trial and error. You learn those things as you get on the road. It's okay to say, forget about it. We don't need it anymore. We're not using it and don't force it. There's um, also some metal fabrication we'd like to do out back. Like we used to have a, a 24 foot pneumatic antenna on the back that the mobile command center used as um, an antenna. Yeah, <laughs> surveillance. So we took that off, but it, it left kind of a yucky looking, you know, metal area there. So we're going to do some, some projects to cover that up in the future. So. Oh, one thing I wanted to touch on is the roof uh, paint. We just painted it white with a roll-on Rust-Oleum. We didn't spray the roof because no one's going to see it. and We didn't want to waste all that time and energy mm -hmm. and money on using auto paint for the roof. It's fine. The Rust-Oleum <laughs> white paint's great. A lot of people use the elastomeric siliconized coating, coating yeah. for the roof. And honestly, I think that's great. We're probably going to switch over to that. Once we do a little bit more work on the bus, totally worth it. I hear wonderful things about temperature differences once you actually have that on there. I think it's Henry's is a great product. But we've actually, I mean, I think because of the work we put in with the insulation, it hasn't been necessary. It hasn't been so necessary, far. but overkill's good. Thank you so much for coming over to our bus and taking a tour of the inside and outside 
Uh, it's been really fun. So we're on Instagram at Wild Drive Life, where we post all kinds of random things, interior, exterior, a lot of photos of my dog and hiking and all that stuff. But something that we really focus on is uh, being debt free. We're super passionate about it. When Ben and I started this whole, you know, dream and process, we had about a hundred thousand dollars of debt, student loan and vehicle debt. We paid it off, we made a plan and paid it off in three and a half years just working our tails off and implementing some different, you know, lifestyle changes. So it's something that we're really passionate about and would love to share in a, a bigger way. So that's part of this. It's not just about the bus for us, it's about that message and delivering it. So uh, I have a website, thewilddrive.com, and we're also going to start a YouTube channel focusing on uh, the financial elements and uh, how this whole lifestyle can be feasible and enjoyable and you can live large in a small space and see wonderful places. And, and live free. Live free. Because you're not free until you're debt free. So the links will be in the description of our uh, social accounts and our YouTube channel and our website. So please check it out. Thank you again. Thanks for coming.